Okay, in this session we are going to look at documents, the strengths and limitations of documents in sociological research. Uh, this is obviously from the methods part of the course, uh, assessed on paper 1 with a 10 marker and paper 3 with a 10 and a 20. Uh, let's get right to it. So, what do we mean by documents? Well, there are two types of documents. We mean public and personal. So let's have a look at public documents first. Public documents are uh, any text that is released by a, an institution or the government. So when Ofsted, uh, which is a non-governmental agency which uh, assesses schools, goes in and observes schools, when they release a report, that is a public document. Uh, when the government, uh, when government departments release reports on uh, certain things that are happening within governance, like uh, the Department for Education or the Ministry of Justice, they will release a report to say uh, how different policies are going. It will be a long document uh, made up of mainly qualitative data, and it will explain. Uh, how things are going. Charities will release public documents all the time. They might release promotional material. Uh, there really is a huge range of public documents. It's really anything, any text that is released by uh, an institution or an agency or a government department. And then on the other side of this, you've got personal documents. Now, personal documents are even wider ranging. Uh, any book is a personal document. Um, Photo albums, photos are personal documents, paintings, pictures, diaries, letters, uh, a, uh, an exercise book that a student has, has filled out, a note that they've scribbled on as the, they've passed to their friends, any uh, text or even image that has been produced by an individual. So it is really incredibly broad ranging documents and uh, it, because of that, it can be a little bit tricky to, to really pin down the strengths and the limitations. But the, the good thing to remember here is they tend to be one-off qualitative texts that uh, focus on explaining a certain point of view, an individual point of view. And that's why they're going to be an interpretivist method. So let's have a look at the practical strengths to start us off. Remember here that practical is about whether you can do the research, whether you can do it quickly or easily, or whether it's expensive, whether you can do the research at all. So documents might actually be the only way to gain information about certain groups. So a good example here is if you want to understand what life was like in, the, uh, in World War I, it may be that reading uh, the notes, or the letters rather, that people sent to each other, particularly that soldiers sent home, that might be the only way of actually gaining an understanding of what life was like for them. And this links very much to our second practical benefit, which is that documents can be the only way that we can uh, study the past. So by looking at paintings, letters, uh, by looking at diary entries, we're able to go back in time and discover what social meanings were like for individuals in the past. We can read material written by kings and queens. We can read material written 200, 300, 400 years ago, even a 1,000 years ago. And it can help us to understand what society was like a long time ago. Remember, with uh, methods like questionnaires and interviews and experiments, you can't go into the past. And so that's a big practical advantage. You can also compare past and present experiences. So by looking at letters sent uh, by soldiers during the First World War, home, you can then look at letters sent home or emails sent home by soldiers in the current wars and see how they compare. And it's also cheap and it can save an enormous amount of time. Cheap because they tend to just be available and free, particularly public documents. It's a simple Google search and you can find things like an Ofsted report and it's freely available. Um, and that obviously saves you enormous amounts of time as well. You don't have to conduct the research yourself. And that's because documents are, just like official statistics, a secondary source of data. Practical disadvantages? Well, authenticity. Now, if something's authentic, it means it's the real deal. It's the real thing. So sometimes it can be difficult for a sociologist to determine if a document is real or fake. So Hitler's diaries is a famous uh, example of, uh, for a while, it was believed to be Hitler's actual diaries. It turned out it was a scam. It was a fake and so, uh, practically speaking, it can be hard to know whether we've got a fake or not, whether we've got a hoax or not. And uh, that's called authenticity. If, if something is authentic, 
then it is the real thing. If it is inauthentic, then it is a fake, like Hitler's diaries. Um, it can be difficult to understand the source, and this is particularly if it's in a different dialect or language. It can be hard for us as sociologists to actually access the meaning uh, or access that, that data in the first place. It might be difficult to understand what a painting is about, uh, and that just means it's hard to study it. Okay, ethical advantages? Well, because it's a secondary source of data, it's already been collected, so there's no harm involved at all. We're not hurting anybody. Uh, they've, for public documents, they've already been released deliberately for people like us to read. So there's very few ethical problems here with reading an Ofsted report or reading a, a, a report by the Department for Education, because that's why they released it. They released it for us to read. What's more, if it is a pub public document, uh, governmental organisations and large charities and businesses, they have to follow ethical guidelines when they're producing these kind of documents. So uh, if the government is collecting data using questionnaires, it follows very strict guidelines about how to do that, confidentiality, privacy, etc. And so we know that when we're using a public document for our research, that the original primary method was collected using ethical guidelines. There's a good example here of the Department for Education. It produces a whole ream of data on education, uh, educational outcomes, uh, results from exams, things like that. But there are no student names. And this is because the Department for Education keeps names confidential. Ethical disadvantages. Well, personal documents in particular may invade the privacy of the person who wrote them. If you just find a diary in your attic that's been left there, that you don't necessarily have permission to read that. And you might be breaking the privacy of the person who wrote that original personal document. And if you want to get permission, well, then you're going to have to try and find their next of kin. Uh, you could publish it if you wanted to without permission, but that would be unethical. It would be wrong. Um, but there's no strict rule against that. Uh, but if you wanted to get permission from the next of kin, that then leads to the practical issue of having to trace their next of kin to try and find who they're close, most closely related to, to ask for permission from them. Uh, reliability. So uh, the advantages for reliability, well, certain public documents are collated in a standardised way. So things like Ofsted reports follow the same structure every single time. Uh, reports on GCSE exams follow the same structure every time. So in that sense, using those can be reliable. But the vast majority of documents, as we will see, lack reliability. They're not standardised at all. Each document is unique, especially personal documents, so diaries, uh, letters. That, that is a one-off case of that document, and it's never going to be repeated. So there's, there's no reliability there. And we just can't repeat that study again and again because we don't have a standardised set format. We have one unique uh, document each time. Validity-wise, though, so let's have a look at some of the biggest advantages here. Well, if we find a letter written by a soldier during the First World War, that's a detailed, rich understanding of another person's meanings. This, is, this links to social interaction theory and labelling theory and interpretivism, where they would say that the only way of understanding society is to go from the bottom up, to look at what individuals think and what they believe. And so by reading somebody's diary, we can then start to get a deep and rich and detailed understanding of what their life was really like, rather than just a kind of quantitative measure of uh, how tall they were or when they were born or what GCSE grades they got. We can actually understand who they were and what they believed. This is qualitative depth. Documents tend to be very rich in qualitative data, huge amounts of written data. And what's really nice about documents is they're not written for us, for sociologists. They are written for the person themselves, particularly personal documents. So questionnaires and interviews and experiments have the problem that people know they are being studied and so they change their behaviour, the Hawthorne effect or the social, or social desirability bias. Uh, whereas here we don't have that at all. So this soldier who's written his letter in the trenches... Uh, it is a natural letter, if you like. It is what he truly would say, because he didn't believe a sociologist was going to be reading it at all. And uh, we lack, therefore, those kind of biases that we have to deal with with things like questionnaires and interviews. Um, 
some public docs can be accurate by law, so they'll be valid by law. Charities have to publish their accounts by law, so that's the money coming in and the money coming out. And if they're, if they're wrong, then that's illegal, and the charity can be closed down, people can be fined. Uh, and so we can be quite confident that the data contained within that is valid, it is true. However, lacking validity, well, authenticity can be a problem here. So if that document is fake, like Hitler's diary, well, then you have no validity because it's completely invented. It's just untrue. Credibility, well, one of the problems we have here is how do we know that the author was sincere? How do we know that they really meant what they were writing? Maybe it was satire. Maybe they were joking. We don't know. How do we know that what they're writing is accurate? So a good example here is that First World War letter again. Well, actually, those letters went through the British censors. People read those letters and threw away ones uh, or adapted ones that were negative about life in the trenches. So is this really a believable source? Uh, is the author really writing their honest opinion or do they want to just get past the censors so that they can get that letter through to their family? Internet sources are a big problem here with credibility. So you might, just because you find something on the internet doesn't mean it's credible, doesn't mean, mean it's believable. And personal docs are only a snapshot. So what we mean by this is that if we read that letter from the First World War, that's one person's belief at one moment. It's a snapshot, like a photograph. And it doesn't give us a rich, detailed understanding of who they are. It gives us an understanding of how they were thinking on that day at that moment. And so really the validity of personal docs is limited to a snapshot, to a single moment in time. It's also a problem with um, questionnaires. Representativeness, so advantages here. Will some public documents contain information with large sample sizes? So charities conduct big surveys and then they produce reports. And you might say that, that that's, that's uh, the data in there is representative because it has that huge sample size. Governments have the same kind of thing. However, most documents lack representativeness in the extreme. Personal documents are often uh, one unique account. So one photograph, one painting, one diary, one book. Sample size is normally one. Absolutely tiny. So almost no representativeness. Not all documents survive. So uh, from the letters from, First World, from the First World War, which letters survived? Well, of the ones that survived, are they typical? Are they representative of everyone in the trenches? Or are the letters which survived the ones that belonged to the wealthy soldiers who could afford pen and paper and you know, to get it back to their families who then kept it in a house and, and looked after it? So the actual documents that we are left with are normally not the normal documents. They're often the documents that are privileged in some way. And so on that theme then, the ones that we get may be biased. Well, why is that? Well, the official documents that we can see are only released 30 years after they were first written. So it's things like the minutes from meetings in Downing Street between the Prime Minister and, and their cabinet. That will, uh, those will only be released 30 years later. So the documents that we have now are not fully representative of every of all the documents because we'd have to wait 30 years to get the fully representative picture of what's happening. Classified documents are never may never be available. So some some things are official secrets, government secrets. And so we don't have those documents. They are simply not available. So the ones that we have, the documents that we do have, are not representative of all the documents that could be available. So, for example, here, if you were going to be studying the First World War, there are some documents which are classified about the First World War, about military strategy, whatever it may be. And so you can't read those documents. So the ones that you have might not tell a representative story. And then certain groups are always underrepresented by documents. People who are illiterate, who can't read and write, are obviously very rarely represented in documents. People with limited leisure time, people who didn't keep diaries and write letters, are very underrepresented. So we're, we're building a picture here of actually documents, particularly personal documents, underrepresent the working class and people who lack education because it tends to be the middle class who have good education and have leisure time 
who are the ones who are writing diaries, writing books, etc., writing letters. We need a good example here from the First World War is we've got lots of that poetry, don't we? Well, the vast majority of our First World War poetry was from uh, wealthy, mainly actually aristocratic soldiers who knew how to read and write, could afford pen and paper, and then would send their poems back. Okay, so that's the basic done for, for public and personal documents. There's one, uh, rather unusually here, there's something that we can do with documents uh, that allows us to turn qualitative data in that document into quantitative data. We can turn words into numbers. So just follow the steps as we go down the page here. A content analysis is when we take a qualitative text, and we're going to use the example here of uh, tabloid newspaper, and we're going to try and turn the qualitative information about young people in that newspaper into numbers. How do we do that? Well, we'll show you. First of all, we've got a hypothesis. Negative language about young people in tabloid newspapers. So we're going to hypothesise that when we look at the tabloid newspapers, that the language that they use about young people is going to be negative. Okay, let's do step two. So let's decide on categories. Well, we're going to have negative adjectives that we're going to look for, negative nouns and negative verbs. And we're going to write a big list of all of these negative words. We're then going to count the number of times that those words are used next to young people. And our final step is quantitative data. So 33% of the adjectives used for young people are negative, or 33% of the noun of the verbs used are negative, whatever it might be. And so by taking by doing a content analysis, we've turned words, just newspaper articles, into numbers uh, using a content analysis. Strengths of content analysis, well, they're cheap, easy to source the data, buy a newspaper, buy a book. No real concerns, it's a secondary source for ethical. And it obviously is more reliable because you're going to then be able to repeat this with multiple different texts, multiple newspapers, multiple books, whatever it might be. You can do content analyses for textbooks. And you're going to have a larger sample size because you're going to be able to use multiple texts or uh, multiple newspapers. However, uh, it can take a long time to carry out this kind of content analysis. Uh, there are no real concerns here ethically, as I said. So it's just to point that out that you haven't really got any negatives for ethical um, but it does, as soon as you turn words into numbers, you then lose meaning. So we just said 33% of adjectives used for young people negative. Okay, why? What kind of words? Why is that important? In what context? All of that meaning is lost as soon as you just use a number. So the interpretivist would say a content analysis is just failing to deal with the actual meanings involved. So are documents positivist or interpretivist? Well, they are favoured by interpretivists. They provide that qualitative data that interpretivists want. And this is because they, uh, and the reason why interpretivists love them is because they tend to give us detail about social actors and their meanings, about people and what they believe in life. However, the positivists can solve this problem because they obviously don't like looking at that. They like looking at sociology in, in terms of science and a macro top-down approach. They can do a content analysis to create quantitative data. Exam questions, paper one, paper three. So paper one and paper three both have a 10 marker where this could come up. Outline and explain two limitations when using personal documents and sociological research. They will probably ask you to be specific between personal and public. They're unlikely to just give you documents in the 10 marker, although they could. Um, two limitations, well, you could take your pick here, really. Probably want to go for practical and um, theoretical, particularly validity. Uh, and then evaluate the use of different types of documents when conducting sociological research for a 20 marker. That's where you'd include just about everything in this presentation. Hopefully that was helpful.